I wanted to talk about security today. And if you listen to the trolls on Reddit, I don't know anything about security. So I decided instead I'll talk about parenting. Because I don't have any kids. So <laughs> you know, if I'm going to talk about things I don't know, I might as well start there, right? You know, parenting has changed a lot. Um, when I grew up, things were very different. Now, in, in the last couple of decades, parenting is completely different. My, my sister just had a baby, and uh, I'm watching her as a parent. I'm like a proxy parent as an uncle. It's, uh, it's really strange. I'm watching these parents. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, Purell didn't exist. Now, it's, it's a miracle we actually made it, right? <laughs> Like we survived, uh, because apparently there's bacteria everywhere. And uh, today's parenting involves uh, gallon jugs of Purell, right? I've, you watch these parents like um, their kid touches a bit of dirt, and they give them a Purell shower right there just to make sure. Not the experience I had, right? I grew up in the 70s. We used to play in the garden, roll around in the mud. We'd make mud cakes. Would our parents freak out? No. We'd eat the mud cakes. Would our parents freak out? No. Mostly because they weren't around. They were like, get out of the house, come back when the sun goes down. And so you have to wonder, um, how did we survive without Purell? And recently, if you, if you read some of the studies, you, you hear about this really interesting phenomenon. The rates of asthma and allergy are through the roof. Turns out, if you raise a child in a sterile environment, they don't develop an immune system. Whoops. And so now there's this new round of parenting that is recognizing this fact, and we're going back to our roots. So now we realize that eating mud cakes in the garden is how you build a robust immune system. Right? You don't get allergies, you don't get asthma. And you know you can take this to the extreme. Um, you have, uh, for example, in the in the third world, um, children don't have extreme allergic reactions to common medications that we have. Why? Because they have even more robust immune systems by being exposed um, to pathogens all of the time from the moment they're born, before they're born. Um, and then in the other extreme, you have this concept of raising a child in a bubble. Bubble boy, right? You remember that story? Bubble boy. It's a tragic story because it's true about a child without an immune system. And there are these um, strange cases or medical tragedies where um, either children are born with compromised immunity or they lose their immunity through some kind of problem. And then they live in a bubble. And you have to be wondering, what the hell is this guy talking about right now? I thought this was going to be a talk about security and Bitcoin, and here we are. We're talking about bubble boys and eating mud cakes. There's a point to this. Hang on. Hang on. So the reason I'm talking about this is because this has some really important implications in security. You see, if you create a system that is isolated from external influences, then it's not that it doesn't have bugs. It's just that you don't know about the bugs that the system has. And if you create a system that is exposed to external attacks all of the time, it's not that it has a lot of bugs. It's just that you know about the bugs that it has because you keep finding them, and in the process you fix them, and in the process the system gets stronger. So this all comes out of a discussion I want to have about an interesting phenomenon we have now, which is this concept of permissioned ledgers and isolated blockchains. Because in my mind, an isolated blockchain is Bubble Boy. Right? It's building a system completely isolated from the world with the hopes that that's going to make it safer. Because banks are like a paranoid helicopter parent that wants to shower their kid in Purell because it touched a booger. And guess what these ledgers are going to get? 
They're going to get asthma and severe allergies. And the worst case is that eventually the bubble bursts. At some point, you get exposed to the outside world. And then you have a scenario where a system that's been isolated for so long has developed no immunity whatsoever. It gets exposed to some horrific, deadly thing like a pollen particle <laughs> and dies a horrible death. <laughs> because it has such low immunity that it reacts horribly to something that a properly stimulated, properly raised organism can resist with ease. Now, this isn't the first time we've had this discussion. In fact, ironically, on the internet, this realization that security by isolation and security by obscurity, and security by control and perimeter, and security by trying to tamp down security research fails, and fails miserably. When I was first on the internet in the early 90s, I was talking to banks and telling them why they should get email servers and connect to this email thing. And they said many of the same things that I hear in Bitcoin today, which is, well, we don't know anyone who uses email. None of the other banks use email, so who am I going to send email to first place? Secondly, that out there uncontrolled thing might be dangerous. Thirdly, our bankers might say something in email, and how do we add a long disclosure form at the bottom? And what happens if any of our people can communicate with anyone at any moment in time? That's a recipe for chaos, anarchy. Of course, they were right. They just didn't think of chaos and anarchy as a good thing. Uh, many of us in this space probably do. So, what did the banks do with their first uh, attempt to join the internet? What did large corporations do with their first attempt to join the internet? Did they connect TCP/IP systems directly to the internet and build robust applications that could communicate over TCP/IP? No. They built moats and walls and perimeters. They implemented perimeter security. They built firewalls and demilitarized zones, DMZs. And they used all of these military analogies to wall themselves in. And then what did they deploy behind these walls? Did they deploy the common open source protocols and capabilities and applications of the internet? No. They deployed highly denatured, weak equivalents like Outlook and Front Page. And they built um, intranet websites that had stale and obsolete content that was only accessible during working hours through a VPN with no influence from the outside. And they said, look, we're doing internet. <laughs> we're so cutting edge. We're hip. And that's how they did internet. They built these highly isolated environments. And for a very long time, the prevailing idea was that by building these isolated environments, they were more secure. Because they could control things through the firewall. Because they could control access to data, creation of data, access to systems. And now we know that was an illusion. Not only can companies not control these things, but in the process of building these isolated systems, they built bubble boy IT. They built IT systems that had no resilience, no immunity. Because Outlook had bugs and front page had bugs. It's just that they weren't tested on the wild internet very often because a lot of the time they lived behind walls. And when we discovered those bugs, it was bad, right? Because eventually someone gets inside the bubble, or the thing that's inside the bubble gets outside the bubble. See the problem with bubbles is that you can't trade through them. And if you're in business, your business is to trade. So if you're a business, you do commerce, and commerce can't happen in a bubble. So the very concept of a bubble is antithetical to commerce. You build your firewall, what's your salesperson going to use on the road? A laptop, which they're going to take outside of the firewall for the very first time, plug it into the hotel internet, 
contract 72 viruses, and then bring it back into the firewall and give it to everyone else. Bubbles didn't work. On the internet, it didn't work. What are we seeing now? We're seeing a whole generation of companies come to the realization that in order to be nimble and effective, they can't be HP, EMC, Cisco, Oracle, Microsoft, havens of secluded little kingdoms that don't talk to anything else. First of all, because that shit's expensive and it doesn't work. And secondly, because it's incredibly vulnerable. It doesn't have immunity. And so now we see this generation of nimble young startups that are true internet companies. Their products, their internal systems, their collaboration, all of it is out there, naked, on the internet. It all happens on GitHub for all the world to see. They use Gmail and collaborate with external email systems all over the world. Their internal systems are external. There is no such thing as internal in the world of the internet. And they are building robust applications, because on day one, those applications live in the wild. And they are more secure. They learn to live out there in the big, scary internet. And those companies are thriving. And they have systems that are much more secure and much more robust. And that was even before the era of whistleblowers and anonymous, who come along and prick these corporate bubbles and get inside and take all of the information and give it out. Now you're probably thinking, well, if permissioned ledgers and closed intranets are bubble boy then the wild internet and bitcoin are like a kid eating mud cakes right a system that has immunity something exposed to pathogens well almost that might have been the analogy i wanted to go for but you know me i'll go a bit further bitcoin isn't the kid that eats mud cakes bitcoin is a swarm of sewer rats Gnarly things, missing eyes and claws and tails, like those pigeons you see in Trafalgar Square that are hopping around with this mutant arm stump. <laughs> and what do they eat? What do they eat? They eat raw sewage. They eat your trash. They eat the most virulent things on the planet. There is nothing in this world that has more strength in its immunity system than a New York rat, or a pigeon, or even, God forbid, a squirrel. Those things are horrible. And so, a rat is not going to have allergies. It's not going to sneeze because of a bit of pollen. <laughs> this thing is already carrying three variations of the plague. Ellis shrugs it off. Because, and that's exactly what Bitcoin is. Malleability? Whew. Attacks? DDoS? Out there in the open. Port 8333, come and get me. And is anybody trying? Hell yes, everyone is trying. For six years, the best and the brightest, the meanest and the most malicious, are throwing everything they can at this deformed swarm of sewer rats out there, these 6,000 nodes that are listening, and God knows how many other nodes that are exposed to the vagaries of the wild internet, and it survives. So what do the banks do? They're going to build bubble boy blockchains. <laughs> They're going to build permissioned ledgers. Do you think permissioned ledgers suffer from transaction malleability? Hell yes, they do. Do you think altcoins suffer from transaction malleability? Hell yes, they do. They just don't get those things fixed, right? And neither will the permission ledgers. And that's just one of the 
thousands and thousands and thousands of bugs and weaknesses and weird exceptions and edge cases that we're going to find while living out there in the wild. And we're going to build this incredibly robust system, which is already taking shape today. I mean, beyond the idea that you could have a decentralized consensus system, the idea that that decentralized consensus system could actually survive for six years is kind of ludicrous. And the only reason the banks have now gone to the point of thinking about permissioned ledgers is because they finally reach the stage of bargaining, the third stage in the five stages of grief for the industry they're about to lose. They start with denial. And the basis of denial is, well, this thing isn't going to work. It's going to die any day soon. And it doesn't. And then they say, well, it's just silly money and it doesn't have any value until it does. And nobody else is going to play with it except that they are. And serious investors won't possibly put money in this except that they did. And it still refuses to die. So we go from denial to bargaining. Somewhere in between there might be some anger, there's going to be some depression, and eventually they're going to reach acceptance. But it's going to take a long time. Because if you look at the internet, we're now on maybe 25 years into the internet in terms of really beginning to broaden its use. 25 years in, and there are plenty of companies out there that think that as long as they put their Oracle, EMC, HP, Cisco, Microsoft shit behind a perimeter firewall, all is going to be well. They are still building bubble boys and intranets on the internet. They haven't learned that lesson after 25 years. It's going to take longer in finance. Not only is decentralization, open protocols, open source, collaborative development and living in the wild a feature of Bitcoin, that's the whole point. And if you take a permission ledger and you say, well, that's all nice. We like the database part of it. Can we have it without the open, decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, open source, non-controlled, distributed nature of it? Well, you just threw out the baby with the bathwater. You're never going to build a bubble strong enough to keep financial information. Ironically, this is all happening at the same time that as banks have finally gone onto the internet, they're leaking. They're leaking so much from every orifice. They're leaking anonymous, WikiLeaks, insiders, all of that stuff. They don't have confidential transactions. They don't have encrypted this. They don't have privacy. They don't have zero knowledge. They have completely open ledgers. And what do they overlay on top of them? KYC and AML. So they attach identities to everything they're doing so that when that database gets leaked, it will have a completely rich history, not only of every transaction, but of every participant in the system. That's what they're building. They're building panopticons. They're building a panopticon of financial information, and it's leaking. Because the truth of panopticons is when you build a panopticon, it stares back. And when it's the internet that's staring back, that's four billion eyeballs. I'm not so worried about my financial information from my bank leaking, because maybe a couple hundred people are going to stare back. But when Angela Merkel's phone numbers and phone calls leak, ooh, everybody's staring. Three days ago, the internal presentations and PowerPoints of the Department of Defense about their drone assassination program leaked. Four billion eyes staring back. You built a panopticon, it's staring back. And so the real question we should be asking about permission ledgers is: do you really want to put KYC AML on Bubble Boy? Because you go and add all of that information, when that database leaks four, five, six, ten years into the future, you're going to give anonymous WikiLeaks historians 
a complete record of every transaction you ever did. The secret slush budget of Lockheed Martin, the black budget of your government, the bribes that you paid to depose a democratically elected government, or to install an oil well in a pristine rainforest. All of that shit is going to be on WikiLeaks and all over the internet. And you're going to provide the rich KYC metadata that you painstakingly attach to every transaction. Meanwhile, we're going to build Bitcoin with encrypted anonymous private transactions. And you'd better rethink this panopticon. You'd better rethink this bubble boy. Because building resilient systems is about exposing them, exposing them to continuous attack. That's how you build resilient systems. So I'm not scared of permissioned ledgers. Denatured, defanged, centralized, weak systems behind bubbles. Those are not going to scale, they're not going to survive, they're not going to be secure, they're not going to be provide, they're not going to be providing privacy, and they're going to backfire badly. But the funny thing is, that lesson is going to take a long time to learn. I can see it now. Sir, we had all of the drone assassination things behind a firewall, but someone burst through the bubble. All right, call the general. Get me two bubbles. We're going to double up. Bubbles within bubbles. Sir, they burst through our double bubble. Titanium bubbles. If we pay Lockheed Martin a hundred million dollars, maybe they can build us a double titanium bubble that we can hide all of our data behind. Sir, it lasted 30 seconds before Anonymous ripped it to shreds and put all our data on the internet. Hmm. I wonder if we can build more bubbles. They think that having your data on the internet without controlling it centrally is weakness. It isn't weakness. That sewer rat out there isn't weak. It's the strongest thing we can build because it's constantly under attack. And wrapping it in a bubble, it doesn't make it stronger. It gradually denatures and weakens it until what's left is a pale, immunosuppressed little lab rat with red eyes that dies the first time it's exposed to the flu. And so that's what security is. Security is a process. It's a process of openness and exposure. It's a process of continuously adapting to new attacks, and in that process, dynamically becoming more and more robust, less and less fragile. We're introducing Bitcoin in a world full of fragile systems. Central banking, centralized banking, monetary systems that can't manage to achieve liftoff in the economy. In that environment, we're introducing a robust, global, decentralized system. And it's robust today. It's not perfect. It's got bugs. But we don't hide those bugs. We announce them. We glorify in them. We discuss them. We invite people to attack it. And we take that information and we make it stronger every single day. And that is why we win. Because while they're building Bubble Boy, we're building a swarm of sewer rats. Thank you.